So how do SGLT2 inhibitors work to protect the kidney? SGLT2 inhibitors have been basically taking the medical world by storm over the past several years, and the advent of all of these new trials showing huge benefits in major adverse cardiac events, heart failure, and CKD have been basically the reason why uh, it's been so popular. And particularly when we're talking about kidney outcomes, uh, we have the 2019 Credence trial, the 2020 DAPA CKD trial, and the 2022 EMPA kidney trial. And all of these have shown basically uh, very astounding results in terms of reducing the rate of progression of CKD, reducing progression to dialysis. And on top of that, each of these trials have basically pushed the limit each time too. So the Credence trial was initially done only in diabetic patients, uh, but then they saw that there was potentially benefits in patients without diabetes. So then they did the DAPA CKD trial, which showed benefits in both non-diabetic and diabetic patients. And then now even the EMPA kidney trial was looking at patients with and without albuminuria. So from what I've learned in the past week is that there's really kind of three main mechanisms for how SGLT2 inhibitors are protecting the kidneys. Now, the first one is really fixing tubuloglomerular feedback. And we're going to discuss what this means because this is a very interesting and fascinating topic. And I'm going to have to draw some nephrons for you guys on that one. They also help decrease uh, the tubular workload and oxygen requirements. And they also have uh, signs of decreased inflammation in multiple studies, which seems to be uh, causing a benefit as well. So for this last one, you know, there's not really much to say. But for this second one and this first one, I want to do a little bit more um, explaining as well. So in terms of the decreased tubular workload, I'm just going to draw a kidney for you guys or a, a nephron. So you're going to have your afferent arterial here. And then this is going to go down. I'm going to try and draw a nice little glomerulus here. And then you're going to have your efferent arterial here. And, you know, there's a lot of little, you know, divots in here for your glomerulus. And uh, basically, you're going to have your Bowman's capsule surrounding it, and you're going to have the rest of the nephron. And you have your little glomerulus here. So imagine you have a patient with diabetes. They're just going to have a ton more sugar and glucose coming into uh, the afferent arterial here and reaching the glomerulus. And what happens is that it is freely filtered outside of the glomerulus. And so you get all of this sugar that goes into the uh, proximal convoluted tubule right here. Now, what the body does in response to this is it has the SGLT2 receptors or the co-transporters, which helps get rid of all of that glucose and reabsorb it into the body. So basically here, you'll have your SGLT2 uh, receptor and your SGLT1 co-transporter. And both of these are just trying to uh, get all of this glucose out of here. And the SGLT2 co-transporter is responsible for about 90% or more of the glucose reabsorption, while the SGLT1 uh, co-transporter is responsible for less than 10%. And basically, you know, this patient with diabetes has so much glucose coming in here that you start to get upregulation of all of these co-transporters. So you're just going to build more of these uh, co-transporters all over the place. And you can imagine that it's a lot of work to get all of this glucose back out of the urine. So it's taking a lot of oxygen in order, to, in order to do this. And what happens when you do this is, you know, you're kind of depriving the rest of the nephron from the oxygen because all of it is being taken up here in this location. And so the more distal parts of the nephron may not, might not get the oxygen that it really needs. So what we do here is we use the SGLT2 inhibitor, we block all of these, and suddenly all of this oxygen that was here is basically freed up to go to the distal nephron and make sure you're not getting tissue hypoxia. And so that's one of the major reasons that we can see uh, decreased kidney injury when we started SGLT2 inhibitor. All right, so that covers, uh, you know, point three and point two. But really what I wanted to talk about and the meat of what this video is going to be on is this uh, change in the tubular glomerular feedback, which I think is the most interesting part of this whole process. And all of this goes back to, you know, in medical school when you learned about how uh, the kidney does auto-regulation of GFR. So it's able to do uh, vasoconstriction and vasodilation of the afferent and efferent arterioles in order to regulate the GFR of the nephron. And this is basically what we're talking about when we're talking about this tubuloglomerular feedback. For example, if I cause vasoconstriction right here at the afferent arterial, I'm going to be decreasing the amount of blood coming down into the glomerular uh, capillaries here, and you're going to essentially be decreasing the GFR. 
Uh, alternatively, you could also constrict the efferent, and uh, what happens here is it actually makes it more difficult for blood to flow out of the efferent arterial. And what happens is you actually increase the GFR because there's more pressure in the glomerulus to push it down into the nephron instead. So I really want you to pay attention to you know what's going to be happening with the afferent and efferent arterioles in the situation of diabetic kidney disease. So I'm just going to draw a little bit more of the nephron here. And this is, uh, let's just say this is the distal convoluted tubule. And you're going to have your macula densa cells right here, which are going to be sensing, you know, the solute that's in your urine. And, uh, you know, what color am I going to pick here for the juxtalar glomerular cells? You remember those from, um, you know, med school. The juxtalar glomerular cells are right here. And so um, let's take this example now and take a look at our diabetic patient. So again, starting from the very beginning, we have a ton of sugar and glucose coming in through the afferent arterial. It's getting filtered out. And our SGLT2 co-transporter is really working hard to suck all this glucose back out of the nephron. And because it's a sodium glucose co-transporter, not only are you sucking out all of the glucose here, and it's coming out like this, but also all of those sodium uh, molecules that are here, so there's a bunch of sodium that's getting filtered here, is also getting sucked out of, the, uh, of your urine as well. And what happens is you finally get down to the distal convoluted tubule, so distal convoluted tubule, and now you barely you have like one or two sodium molecules, right? It's like normally you should have like, let's say you would have 10 or 15 uh, sodium molecules here. Instead, you have a really, really decreased amount of uh, distal delivery of this sodium. And so the macula densa actually senses this, and it takes this to mean, oh shoot, our GFR is actually low. I need to make some changes in order to get the GFR back up. So what the macula densa is going to do is it's actually going to have uh, these juxtalar glomerular cells actually reduce agents to vasodilate the afferent arterial, right? So it's going to release nitric oxide, and then instead of looking like this, all of a sudden you get a much bigger uh, caliber of the afferent arterial. And that means your amount of blood coming in is going to significantly increase, all right? So that's going to be vasodilates due to the release of nitric oxide. The other thing that's going to be released by these juxtalar glomerular cells is renin. And if you remember the whole renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, this is a very interesting kind of mechanism. So it's going to re release renin. So what happens with renin is you got all this angiotensinogen, which is made in the liver. The renin is going to come in and it's going to convert that into angiotensin 1. And then that is going to uh, be converted by the ACE or the angiotensin 1 converting enzyme in the lungs and kidney epithelium or endothelium into angiotensin 2. And what angiotensin 2 does, it causes a lot of uh, vasoconstriction of your blood vessels. And in particular, in this scenario, we're really talking about the efferent arterial. So you're going to start seeing vasoconstriction here. And remember at the very beginning when I told you, uh, you know, vasoconstriction at the efferent arterial is going to result in an increased GFR as well mainly because you're, you're increasing the pressure uh, in the glomerulus, right? So both of these mechanisms are going to cause increased GFR. So vasoconstriction. The problem with all of this is that now you're increasing the GFR even more, and uh, the kidney is really not meant to handle, you know, this huge load of solute that's coming in. And so much glucose, so much sodium, and you're eventually going to start getting like this hyperfiltration injury because you're just putting so much pressure uh, on the kidney and the glomerulus. And over time, this is going to lead to worsening of the chronic kidney disease. So this is basically how diabetes is causing a worsening CKD in a lot of patients and leads to diabetic kidney disease. Now, again, we're going to take a look and see what happens when you add that SGLT2 inhibitor. So again, we're going to knock out greater than 90% of the sodium and glucose uh, reuptake in the proximal convoluted tubule. So now, of course, you're going to sp start spilling a lot of this uh, glucose into your urine, and you're going to get glucosuria, which you'll see on a urinalysis. But you're also going to see less reabsorption of this sodium in the proximal convoluted tubule. And what this is going to do is it's functionally going to basically increase the amount of distal delivery of sodium. So now instead of those tiny few molecules there, you get all of this sodium and your macula densa is like, oh my gosh, there is so much solute here. I need to make sure that I'm actually reducing 
the um, GFR of the kidney. And so you get basically a reversal of all of this kind of, you know, physiology that was not benefiting the kidney earlier. So instead of vasodilation, you're going to get vasoconstriction at the afferent arterial. And this is mediated by the release of adenosine. So instead of uh, nitric oxide, it's going to release adenosine. And we're going to start protecting the kidney by not exposing it to those huge high pressures that we were doing earlier. So let's start to cut down on this afferent arterial and just get rid of all of this uh, hyperfiltration over here. In addition, you're no longer going to get that release of renin because the macula densa thinks, you know, there's a lot of solute coming in. And so you're not going to get this vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial. That's going to leave it dilated. And again, all of this is basically going to reduce uh, the amount of hyperfiltration and increased port, uh, glomerular pressures here in the glomerular capillaries. So that's pretty much it. That's how the SGLT2 inhibitors protect your kidney. It's because basically it's reversing all of these detrimental autoregulation changes that are occurring in diabetes, uh, which, you know, the kidney is basically kind of getting confused and now we're fixing it and we're actually telling it, please reduce your GFR and make sure that you're not injuring yourself by thinking falsely that, you know, you need more pressure in, in your glomerulus. Um, the other thing I did want to mention really quickly is, uh, you know, where the ACE inhibitors, you know, come into play as well. So let me get a different color here. So uh, those ones are also going to work on the efferent arterial, and they are going to cause vasodilation. So uh, further vasodilation with your ACEs and ARBs. And this is, again, very helpful because, again, you're going to be reducing the pressures in your glomerulus and basically helping protect it. The trials that we have showing that ACE and ARBs are renoprotective in the setting of diabetic kidney disease are all the way back from like the 90s, I believe, the renal trial and the IDNT. So basically, with the SGLT2 inhibitor, we are helping constrict the afferent arterial. And with the ACEs and ARBs, we are helping to dilate the efferent arterial. And both of these mechanisms are basically reducing the pressure in the kidneys, reducing all that hyperfiltration and injury, and that's what's helping our kidneys to be protected. So I'm not sure if all of that made sense to you. I think the drawings in my head were a little bit better than the drawings I was able to do there. But hopefully just kind of going through, you know, the thought process of how they uh, protect the kidneys was helpful for you. And I think the, uh, the way the kidney auto-regulates its GFR is really pretty interesting, and it's important to know. There's a couple more slides that I wanted to show, uh, basically from a lecture we got from one of our nephrologists here, Dr. Weigley, and it might be a little bit more clear on these slides. Um, and then I also wanted to go over some of the expected side effects of starting SGLT2 inhibitors based on, you know, now what we know uh, about how they work. So uh, here are some slides from uh, Dr. Weigley's lecture. And you can see here on the left, we have this diabetic nephron. And then we have a diabetic nephron on the right with SGLT in inhibition. So again, you're seeing the glomerulus here with Bowman's capsule and the proximal convoluted tu tubule. And there is a ton of sodium, chloride, and glucose. And the SGLT2 co-transporters are working overtime to reabsorb this all into the body. Now, what happens is all of this solute is just really, really low now. And so the macula densa is like, oh my gosh, we got to dilate those afferent arterioles. And you dilate them, you increase the GFR even more, cause higher pressures in the glomerulus, worsen the injury, and basically all of your kidney disease gets worse. Now, with the SGLT inhibition, we're now blocking these SGLT2 co-transporters. So you have decreased reabsorption here. And now look how much solute is coming down into your ascending loop of Henle and then your distal convoluted tubule. And the macula densa now senses this. It's going to release that adenosine and vasoconstrict the afferent arterial. So you can see the reversed afferent vasodilation. And all of this helps reduce those glomerular capillary pressures and help protect the kit and help protect the kidney in the setting of diabetic kidney disease. So one of the things that uh, people are very uh, worried about is this initial GFR decline. And they're like, if we started SGLT2 inhibitor, man, I see these people's GFR get worse. You know, this seems like a bad thing to be doing. But actually, this should be determined as an acute renal success because that means we're actually uh, affecting the physiology in a way that we want to in order to protect the kidneys. So um, basically what you see in these graphs here is the acute and long-term effects of SGLT2 inhibitors on the estimated GFR. And you can see with empagliflozin, canagliflozin, dap dap dapagliflozin, you have this initial sharp 
decrease in the GFR, but then it really has like this slow decline. Whereas in patients who are not taking an SGLT inhibitor, they don't have that initial decline, but their rate of decline over time is much faster. And so you can see the renal protective effects of starting the SGLT2 inhibitor here, whereas the placebo um, doesn't have that initial drop, but just over time, their CKD definitely gets worse. The same results are seen for both canagliflozin and dipagliflozin as well. So when you're starting an SGLT2 inhibitor, you should expect some decrease in the GFR. It's just like when you are starting uh, an ACE inhibitor, and again, you're vasodilating the efferent arterial, it's going to cause some reduction in GFR. You're going to see a bump in your creatinine, but as long as it's less than 30% or so of a bump in your creatinine, uh, we can consider it normal and, and kind of expected. SGLT2 inhibitors are playing a bigger and bigger role in all of healthcare, from diabetes to heart failure to CKD. And so I think it really benefits all of us to have a better understanding of how they're actually mediating these positive outcomes. Outcomes. And understanding a little bit more about tubular glomerular feedback, that's a, that's a mouthful, um, I think is very interesting and useful for you to know because I'm sure there's going to be a lot more you know, treatments targeting this pathway in the future. So I hope that video was a little bit interesting to you at the very least and helpful in understanding the mechanism of how SGLT2 inhibitors are working. In my next video, I'm going to go over the kind of summary of all the trials of the SGLT2 inhibitors and basically go over how they went from this you know, simple diabetes medication to basically taking the medical world by storm over the past decade. So thanks again for watching. I hope to see you in the next video and peace.